Hello St. Pius Small Groups, it's been a great series so far, and thank you for letting me join you for this fourth and final week. We began by simply reflecting on how God wants so much more for us than just happiness. Happiness, and when we're enjoying it in appropriate ways in our lives, it pleases God. He created it. It's just that that's not the goal, and it's not the destination either. It's not ultimately or only what He wants for us. He wants more. Ultimately, what he wants for us is something we experience in the deepest part of ourselves, our soul. What God wants for us is joy. It's not circumstantial. It's entirely independent of circumstances. It's not temporary. It's long-lasting, even permanent. Joy is not something you can buy or manufacture or make, nor is it something that someone else can ever even give you. Ultimately, it's a gift from God, a sure and certain sign of the presence and power of the Almighty. The Bible calls it the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit that's given to us. And when you live your life with joy, gratefully receiving and living it in this gift, it changes and transforms your life, at least gradually. And eventually, it does and works in all of your relationships. And if you're a Christian, a follower of Christ, joy is absolutely essential to being a disciple of Christ, a Christ follower. God wants to use you to bring others to Him, and your joy is your most compelling case for others to follow Christ. Just as we said conversely, grumpy Christians and congregations are the number one reason unchurched people say they don't want to go to church. Your joy is your most compelling case for Christ, but you've got to pursue it. You've got to be on the lookout for it. It's about positioning yourself to be able to receive it, to be on the lookout for it, and to follow it. In wrapping up the series, I want to send you away with three words that you can use so that you can find joy on a daily basis. These three little words were at the heart of Jesus' message of preaching and teaching, and they are crucial if we're to receive and enjoy the gift of joy. We find these three words in the Gospel of Mark. The passage we're looking at begins like this. After John had been arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the Gospel of God. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 15. So John the Baptist, who had prepared the way for Jesus, is arrested because he ran afoul of the king Herod. John's arrest and the effective end of his ministry for Jesus becomes a clear signal that's now time for him to step up and begin his public ministry, preaching and teaching. John had finished his job of preparation, and now Jesus is getting to work. From the beginning of Jesus' Jesus ministry, his message is unexpected. This is a different time. God is doing something different, a turning point in all of human history. The kingdom of God is at hand. Now, the kingdom of God is an expression used extensively by Jesus throughout his preaching. He never actually explains it. He demonstrates it instead. That's because it's not a place. It's a presence and a power the presence and power of Christ, and the movement he was launching. That's the movement that we're a part of. That's what this is all about. God invites us right now to enter his kingdom. While our faith does point to a future heaven and future fulfillment, life and rewards in time to come, the invitation of Jesus is to enter into that kingdom right now. Because it's not a place. It's a presence and power. The presence and power of Christ in our world. The kingdom of God is at hand. Those three little words, is at hand. So the kingdom of God has come. God is up to something amazing, Jesus says. But we have a part to play if we're to enter and experience the joy of the kingdom. So therefore, what? What do we have to do to experience this kingdom? Jesus tells us. He continues to say, repent. Now, repent's not a word we like to hear or use. It often has a negative connotation in our minds. Maybe you think of it a strange, scary-looking people holding signs that read, Jesus is coming, turn or burn. Hell and fire, brimstone preachers, prophets of doom and gloom. You hear a word like that and reminded of why you don't like to go to church to begin with, because it's all negative and designed to make people feel bad about themselves or guilty. But in fact, despite its negative connotation, The word repent is a translation of a Greek phrase in the New Testament, which is quite positive. Far from a threat, it's actually an invitation. It literally says, 
Why not change your mind? An invitation. An invitation to think differently. What's he asking us to think differently about? Repent and believe in the gospel. Now gospel is also the translation of another Greek phrase, good news. So another way of saying this Bible passage, repent and believe in the gospel, is why not change your mind about the good news? The rest of Jesus' preaching and teaching are an unfolding of the depth and breadth of what that good news is. Good news that there is a God in heaven who loves you. Good news that he sent his son to die for you. Good news that he gave you a spirit to remain with you and direct your steps when you'll let him. Good news that no matter how many times you fall and fail God, he will never, ever give up on you. Good news that he is not finished with you yet, that he is working with you to make you into the person he had in mind when he created you. Good news that ultimately light triumphs over darkness, life triumphs over death, and ultimately good conquers evil. Good news that life, despite all its challenges and difficulties, really can be lived with joy. Why not change your mind about that? Repent and believe in the gospel. Why not change your mind about the good news? Belief starts in the mind, but it doesn't end there. Action and obedience ultimately follow our belief, if our belief is authentic and sincere. To change our mind about the good news means ultimately changing our behaviors, living our lives based on Jesus' directions and teachings for living. There is a change in thinking that when made leads to a change in behavior, which if followed in a disciplined manner will lead to a change in heart, which is joy. Here's the truth. Today is the day the Lord has made, and he invites us to rejoice and be glad in it. Now is the appointed time for us to experience the joy God has to offer. This is our chance and our opportunity. If you're finding joy elusive, ask yourself what is it exactly that you believe? Because whatever it is, you really can change your mind. Change your mind, change behavior, and allow your heart to then change too. God offers us infinite joy and grace, free of charge, and it starts now. Our job is not to manufacture joy. We can anyways. Our job is to position ourselves to receive by removing obstacles we place in the way. The world can offer us countless pleasures and even genuine happiness, but it cannot offer us even a single moment of joy. Only God can do that. On the other hand, once we have it, neither can the world ever take it away. Thank you.